Welcome and uh, thank you for joining the COP27 post-match analysis, which is hosted by the research program Mr. G Politics, the Center for Climate Science and Policy Research at Linköping University and Stockholm Environment Institute. Uh, just a few words on, on those who are hosting the, the event, Mr. G Politics, it's an eight-year program analyzing the dynamics between the changing geopolitical landscape and the prospects of reaching the climate goals and the sustainable development goals. Uh, it's hosted it's collaboration between several universities, but it's hosted by uh, Stockholm Mind Institute, who is the host for the program then. And SCI is one of the world's most top ranked research institutes, which has been uh, focusing on and contributing to international uh, climate collaborations and the work for chiseling out how we can deal with climate change internationally since its very start in 1989. And the Center for Climate Science and Policy Research has been uh, around since uh, early 2000s, looking at the, the politics and governance and the impacts of climate change and has been present at the COPs uh, at least since 2004. So this, uh, some words on who's behind this event. We're very glad that you have joined. We have a fantastic panel. So I look forward to, to the discussions. And my name is Björn Ola Linnea. I'm a professor at Linköping University and also an affiliate of Stockholm Environment Institute and also the director of the Mr. Geopolitics program. And I'm so thrilled and honored to be able to ask the questions to this panel. That's going to be super fun. But uh, so can you. Uh, in the, uh, yeah, this is the panel. Okay. I come to you that you can ask the questions a little bit later. This is the panel uh, that we are so thrilled to have. So Matthias Frumeri, he is the head of delegation to the UNFCCC at the Swedish Ministry of Environment and uh, a well-known person for us who work in climate, but also to the public and frequently commenting the the negotiations both before and during COPs to the Swedish audience at least. Uh, Richard Klein, uh, he's a senior research fellow at Stockholm Environment Institute and has been uh, one of the, uh, those who spearheaded the climate adaptation agenda in the UNFCCC. He's also a professor here at Linköping University, adjunct professor already back in, well, over 10 years since you became a professor here. Uh, Emma Modere Viking, she's the, the Global Head of International Sustainable Business, uh, CEO Office uh, of Business Sweden. So, and uh, very active and, and driving a lot of the work of business at the COPs. And um, it's going to be exciting to hear more about that work here today. Then we have Malaika Mikkelson, who is a uh, a doctorate researcher here at the Center for Climate Science and Policy Research at Linköping University, focusing on one of the most topical issues uh, at COP27, loss and damage. And she recently returned from a research visit to Fiji, making interviews in many villages that are, are exposed to, to, to climate change. So very glad that you want to join us as well. And then we have Tinichi Regal Regalado, who is a climate re at climate research and diplomacy at the Manila Observatory and also a Yango representative. A Yango is the children and youth constituency at the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and still in Egypt, if I understood it correctly. So the, what we heard from uh, several of you have heard from uh, Shami Sheikh is the poor internet connections and, and that still remains. So I think that Tunichi will go off and on with this camera. Okay, but thank you all for uh, joining this panel and I very much look forward to the discussions today. Uh, as I said, we will have questions. Uh, I will first start off uh, a round of questions uh, and then uh, when it's about 20 minutes left of the seminar, we will go to the questions posed by the audience, but you can already now start to post your, your questions in, in the Q&A function on the top bar of uh, the chat box with the question marks. So with that, uh, I would like to start immediately so we have as much time as possible to, to discuss what unfolded in at COP27. And the first question, we had this uh, the last year as well. I think it, it's, um, we will start with two, two questions that, that 
to, to the panel, we go through the, the whole panel and then we go uh, one by one and, and have a little bit of a discussion. But the first question is, what will we remember from COP27 in 10 years time? And should we start in, in the order that I presented you? So Matthias, would you like to start? Thanks very much, Bjornola, and great to be with you uh, at this post-match analysis. I think well, if we're just sort of looking to what I mean, the media reporting and also conversations with, with colleagues, I think the, the new uh, or to be developed the fund for loss and damage, I think is one of the sort of the key outcomes from COP26, which probably will be uh, remembered also in 10 years time. But it'll be interesting to hear also fellow panelists as to the, the extent of the pushback we saw also from uh, from fossil fuel producing states in terms of including the mentioning of phasing out of all fossil fuels to to what extent that also will be remembered in 10 years time and hopefully will be in that in it will be in another space in 10 years time and and will have actually included that kind of language in the decisions text from the COP. Thanks Richard. Yeah, thanks very much. And uh, I, I also thought about the uh, loss and damage uh, fund at the same time. I think it will really be remembered once it's operational. Um, so I, um, I I picked another, um, I think, achievement of uh, Sharm el Sheikh, which is uh, the work program on just transitions, which has been agreed uh, under the uh, agenda item of response measures. Response measures used to be uh, the agenda item where the oil producing countries uh, sort of um, were gathering to make life difficult for all the other agenda items. And it has evolved in a very positive way into um, what I think is, is an important work program on just transitions, uh, which recognizes that uh, climate policy can lead to um, winners and losers, not only in oil producing states, but everywhere. What I think is important is that it will also recognize that adaptation can lead to winners and losers, and that the notion of just transition is just as relevant uh, to adaptation as it is to mitigation. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Emma. I can only echo the, the previous uh, speakers as well. I think also besides that, we see a really clear shift as well from talking before a lot about mitigation and way more now about adaptation and loss and damage. And of course, I mean, the breakthrough is definitely the loss and damage package and fund. Um, and I think it also says a lot where we are. It feels like we are aware of the climate crisis has come to the point that we are a little bit beyond only mitigation. There's way more focus on adaptation and, and damage and loss. Great, we will return to, to that uh, in a while. Thank you so much, uh, Malika. Thanks, Bianola. I hope that this COP will be remembered uh, more for the historic deal made on the loss and damage um, uh, fund and less for its failures. And what stood out for me was that the developing countries uh, in general, and the small island developing states in particular, were extremely determined and their unity was evident in securing the decision for the response fund. And that this was done in spite of strong resistance from developed countries, um, where the alliance of small island states said um, these developed countries were furiously trying to stall the progress. And even worse, they were attempting to undermine small island developing states and playing games in the process. So I think those are uh, the resolve that this, the small island developing states displayed is something that for me uh, will stand out from this pop. Thank you. We will, of course, return to the loss and damage as well and the future of uh, what will happen there. Um, Yes, uh, and uh, Tunichi. Are you with us, Tunichi? Yes, hello. Am I audible? I, yeah, thanks. Yes, so I think what we'll remember you know, down the line really here and you know, among others is that uh, 27 and the establishment of the loss and damage fund. It really is win for our communities and the institutions working on the ground, frontline workers, as well as activists who have been calling for the creation of a facility that can adequately respond to climate needs. Uh, we, you know, we are looking at it at a 
very hopeful lens and it is still a long road ahead of us for loss and damage and hopefully in years that we see you know come after this and we see some real progress with regards to moving the pin really so the specifics of the fund still need to be laid out the source of the fund remains to be identified in addition to that you know, of course we will remember the circumstances and background of cop 27 both politically and really the realities of holding a huge cop really at a, in the background of a very real sense of police state and it's very difficult for people to really find their common ground with regards to having to work with the other parties in developing countries as well. So I'm very hopeful actually that in the next 10 years that we do make progress on and not just on the specific fund, but really on the operational modalities of the other agreements that will, that will be set forth after you know, post the Glasgow Climate Attack and the Sharmers Transportation Work Program. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so, uh, I think some of you have already perhaps started to 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 give some of your insider tip in this conversation or already in the first question. Because my second question is then, since you all have been in Sharm el Sheikh during the, the COP and have covered different venues and different arenas. It is to ask you about your insider tip. What has me the media reporting missed or, or what has not been on the radar in the public discussions uh, that are important for the outcomes of Glasgow and, and our assessment of, sorry, Sharm el Sheikh, of course, <laughs> uh, that are important for our assessment of Sharm el Sheikh. Should we go the other way around now and start with Tunichi? If we can make contact with Sharm el Sheikh. Okay. Uh, do you hear us, Tanichi? Uh, we'll uh, come back to Tanichi and uh, Malika. Would you like to go ahead? Yeah, I think some of the same resolve of the SIDS, uh, the small islands developing states that I mentioned before, that shouldn't be underestimated. There's been a palpable to shift in tone from these countries where they are no longer reticent in pushing back against the big countries and they're organizing to look into more sophisticated ways of applying pressure to rich countries. And I don't expect that to change. Uh, so I think that uh, maybe some attention should be paid to that because I don't think that, that will change anytime soon. I think they will continue to build on this sort of momentum um, that they've uh, established at this COP. Thanks. Uh, Emma? I think we have seen a lot of focus on the challenges and the urgency and perhaps a little bit um, less of the opportunities and also the solutions that we have in place. And something that really struck me throughout these two weeks in, in Sharm el-Sheikh, but also previous uh, COPs, uh, not least um, Glasgow last year, is the severe disconnection between the negotiations and also the very much solution-based discussions that we see taking place in the in the blue zone, where several pavilions um, are being, um, I mean, showcasing really front-running solutions from scientists, but also companies that have solutions in place. And I think the interesting part is when we have been interacting with different uh, negotiators and, and uh, world leaders and a minister for climate for several countries, even for I mean, yeah, small island states that will no longer exist if we do not reach the 1.5 target or limit. When we're asking that, what do you need? What is needed? What solutions do you need in order for us to transform? They don't really have the answers to it. So we see that the severe disconnection and also lack of knowledge between the challenges and, and, the, and the problems and the issues and actually the, the solutions and the innovations in place. And that is something that we see could definitely be matched. <laughs> if we talk the same language and if we have time to talk to each other and something that we've been discussing throughout these weeks would be that what would happen if we actually would have some roundtables discussions where we have matchmaking or pitch, pitch sessions between the different 
negotiators and, and different states where they're lining up their NDCs and their and their NAPs and, um, and, and their challenges. And then on the other hand, we have scientists and the companies presenting their solutions to really match the, the, the challenges and, and the solutions. And perhaps that would give us other outcomes from, from the negotiations if the world leaders knew actually what solutions that we have in place that can be matched with the with the crisis and the challenges that we have today. So that is something that I see that we've been missing out of in, in the media coverage, but also I say something that we've been missing uh, huge missed opportunities at COP considering how much um, I mean, fantastic innovations and scientists and people that actually travel to COP that have so much to offer to the negotiations. I um, that's my biggest uh, learnings or key takeaways take away, take, takeaways from from this COP. Thanks, uh, Richard. Thank you. Um, yeah, what what has the media missed or what has not been on the radar? Um, my answer is a bit of a, a process um, answer. Um, I think what the media has reported is that there was um, very limited progress at some point in the negotiations. Uh, there were many open agenda items and it only really came to a close at the very end of things. And um, but it didn't really go into the why that was the case. And, and one of the reasons I think was because there was uh, less time than usual to actually talk about uh, various of these uh, issues. First of all, because just like in Glasgow, uh, Egypt invited uh, heads of state to uh, to come to Sharm el Sheikh, uh, which um, eased up time of the negotiations. Um, and many of the negotiators weren't actually available to negotiate because they had to accompany the head of state. Uh, but perhaps even more important, um, the Egyptian presidency decided uh, that it wanted to um, have a covered decision um, on top of, of the various individual decisions of the agenda items, which is something that was sort of taken taken for granted as if that's always the case. But it's, it's a relatively new phenomenon to have a covered decision that sort of summarizes uh, the state of, of, of play and, and the, 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 the ambition. Um, and, and the covered decisions that I'm aware of, they were either there to highlight a particular achievement or to, um, you know, in a way, flatter the, 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 host, uh, the host government. Glasgow made the covered decision into an opportunity to summarize the, um, uh, the, the pledges and, and, and other uh, important things that were said by the heads of state there. Um, but in, in, in Sharm el Sheikh, there really wasn't that much um, sort of new that came out of the head of state uh, segment. Uh, I think this COP could have done easily without a cover decision, but the presidency decided it wanted to have one. And again, this was a major distraction from the actual negotiations. It'd be interesting to hear what, what Matthias has to say about that. Thank you. Okay, so I, I was going to ask the same question to you then, of course, and you will have a chance to say that, Matthias, but maybe you want to respond to since you got a direct question from Richard. Thanks. Well, I, I think I'll actually pick up on the point which uh, which Emma made in, in terms of uh, what not has been reported as much. And I, I mean, I, I would actually look to the non-negotiated out, outcome, um, what has been showcased in all the various pavilions. And of course, I'd from a Swedish perspective, I'd particularly like to highlight the work of Business Sweden and, and the many companies that they brought together in the Swedish pavilion and the kind of opportunities that they highlight and can offer to countries globally to facilitate the, the an accelerated transition in, in those countries. And I think it's interesting to see the statement which John Kerry put out after COP27 on sort of US achievements during the COP. Quite a long statement, but a very short piece in that statement was actually about the negotiations themselves. Most of it was about various types of initiatives that the US had been part of launching and, and sort of engaging in during the COP. So I guess that sort of shows maybe potentially the, the role of the COP no longer only being focused on the negotiations themselves, but being an arena where a number of various types of um, sort of climate action related activities can be highlighted. Um, and, and thereby showing the kind of, of um, progress that we need to make at the COPs. Uh, so I think that's maybe something which was not as reported. I mean, at least Swedish media, I think, were very much more focused on the negotiations themselves. I mean, rightly so, but I think there's a lot of, go a lot of things going on outside also the negotiation space. 
Mm-hmm. When it comes to the COVID decision in particular, I mean, um, I guess, you know, you, you could probably argue the benefits uh, of, of having a COVID decision or not, but with Glasgow, it has now turned into one of the key pieces of how the COP is being assessed. Uh, and, and if we wouldn't have had a COVID decision, I think that from sort of a, from a negotiator's perspective, um, we would have seen that as a failure um, and that, you know, we couldn't agree a, a cover statement. Um, and now we have, and I think it's meaning we, as has been expressed also other, you know, in, in other channels, we would have liked to see it being more ambitious, but there are still a couple of elements in there. I mean, just to highlight one, the uh, decision to launch something which is called the, the Sharm el Sheikh dialogue on uh, Article 21C of the Paris Agreement, which we as the EU couldn't get on the agenda because other parties resisted that, but is now part of the cover decision itself. Uh, and it's not reflected in the other sort of in the other outcomes during in the other agenda items. So it provides also sort of a space and a vehicle for highlighting issues which are maybe not part of the agenda as such. So, so in that sense, I mean, I, I would think it's um, it is a useful vehicle. But I mean, I take the point that it's sort of takes time also from the other items which are on the agenda as such. Well, thanks. That's very interesting. It, it, your answer also touches upon something that I, I had have that that I thought about asking you, but I haven't. But we can maybe we can return to that towards the end. And that is uh, that is Shami Sheikh has really spurred uh, the discussion on uh, on a reform of the COP and and to find alternative ways to do this. And that, that is super interesting to follow now. It's re- sort of been a catch up effect after Shaman Sheikh, even though this discussion has been going on for a long time, of course. But yeah, we'll see if we can return to that <laughs> and have your your insights on that later on. But for now I would like to then continue to you with you, uh, Matthias. Uh, towards the end of the uh, the summit, the EU climate chief, uh, the first team of months, uh, made headlines in the in the news, uh, threatened to walk out uh, from a, a bad decision and warning that uh, the EU could not uh, accept that the 1.5 uh, dies here and today, as he said. Uh, which and I got got a lot of questions. And uh, what do I think? Will it crash or not? So, so well, I didn't think so. I thought they would stay, and they did. Uh, but in spite this, is they stayed? Uh, the EU still backed the deal that there were no progress on the mitigation. A work program or and uh, no mentioning of the fossil fuels phase down. So really there was nothing more that ensured the 1.5 degree. Uh, to me, to my knowledge, that was decided after they threatened to walk away. So was it the right decision to stay? For the EU? But I mean, definitely, I think it, it was the right decision to stay. Um, and I think also it was the right decision to make that public announcement um, at the time when it was made. And I mean, it, it was it, it was quite a forceful statement. Um, and uh, I, of course, one could always sort of discuss afterwards the tactics of, of it. But I think it was an important point to make. Um, and, you know, we, we might have had a different outcome if we wouldn't have made that statement that publicly uh, at, at the stage of negotiations. But I mean, it, the, when we put forward from the EU side our uh, suggestion on on the fund. I mean, it was a different suggestion than the G77 had proposed. So it was sort of um, uh, our, our way of how we wanted to go about for the fund. Um, that was also made in the context of us making progress on mitigation as well, um, because we wanted sort of to have to sort of to cover um, other areas on the agenda um, as well. And we didn't see that we we got that kind of response. Um, when after we had put forward a, that suggestion on the fund. So, I mean, that that this the statement was sort of part of highlighting that we wanted to see progress across the agenda items as well. So I think it was the right thing to do to, to make the statement, but it was also the right thing to do um, to to ensure that we actually had an outcome at at uh, at COP27. OK, so we should not interpret it that the G77 called the EU bluff. I mean, I, I I don't think it was a bluff. Uh, I mean, if we, we it was, I mean, as, as also as our, our minister said, you know, we those words were not uttered lightly. Um, it was after serious consideration within the EU on sort of where we were in the negotiations. And we, we our assessment at that time 
uh, was that uh, it wasn't look the outlook wasn't wasn't it wasn't good. Um, and we felt the strong need sort of to, to highlight that also publicly uh, and to make sure that we are voices where sort of the, the, the voice of the EU was heard in terms of what we wanted to have as an outcome. Okay, so should we also interpret it that, that the EU still thinks that 1.5 is alive? Indeed, I mean, I think that's, uh, of, of course, it's, it is challenging to be, to be, to, to keeping temperature rise to 1.5, but is, but, but as the IPCC says, and I, I mean, I think that comes back also to the, to the point on opportunities that Emma made. Um, there are solutions in every sector to make sure that we do actually limit temperature rise to 1.5, and those are the solutions that we should be looking for. Yeah, Emma. Uh, I mean, I definitely agree. agree. And I think it's really important also to also understand that the, I mean, of course, that the 1.5 degree target slash limit is is obviously a matter of survival, not for for the existence of, of of us, but also actually for the for the companies. And that's also why they're coming to to COP because they are saying we have the innovations in place and we are ready to do our part. However, we fail to scale these innovative solutions that can support other countries in their transformations because of different regulatory um i mean yeah hinders and the legislations is is yeah kind of blocking the the transition so that's why they're coming there and saying that we need to fossil uh, to, to phase out fossil fuel subsidies, we need a price on carbon, we need to have um, a robust um, I mean, standards and regulations on how we can measure and, and also report on uh, CO2 emissions and to have a trading uh, emission system for, for negative emissions and, and have a level playing field and also drive the right incentives so that we can scale these innovations that we have in place. So that's why also the 1.5 degree target is really, really crucial for for the companies and, and their existence as well. Well, yeah, well, so but we I follow the negotiations for quite some time now, and I think for the Paris Agreement, business evidence has played a, a really important role, and not the least within when the, the global climate action agenda started and so on. But for several years, high hopes have been placed on the business to deliver actions, and, and I think it was uh, perhaps uh, in, in Glasgow, it was really evident that that uh, all the hopes go to, to business to deliver the fast action uh, needed to 2030 at least. Uh, but still, the emissions continue to rise one at least one percent last year. Right. So, are we too optimistic about the role of business? Is that question to me? Yes, that's to you. I mean, I would definitely not say so, actually. I think there's also, I mean, there's also so much that the companies can do, right? Um, but the message, I mean, from the companies are that, yes, we have the innovations in place, we are ready to scale, but we need the right preconditions for us to actually, to actually scale. And, um, and I think that is really the, the issue here that we they're eager to do their part. They have solutions in place, but this is the severe uh, disconnection once again between the, with the between the actually challenges and the solutions that we have in place. The companies, if we just look at uh, the Swedish journey, for example, it started off with the political uh, incentives and regulations back in the 90s. I mean, even before as well, that when, when we put the first uh, tax on, on, on carbon, the companies needed to innovate more res resource efficiently. They needed to innovate complete new ways of working. And that has led to them now being, I mean, from the Swedish point of view and the Swedish private sector is being really um, ahead and driving the green transition. Um, but now they are saying that once again, we have the solutions, we have the innovations. Now we need the politicians support so that we can actually scale up and both, I mean, sure, I mean, for them to reach their net zero targets um, and also support other countries and their transformation. And we see that the companies are collaborating cross borders and cross sectors, and they're even collaborating with their competitors to find new solutions. And they're also teaming up with scientists to see how can we do even more. But once again, there's also, I mean, it comes to a certain point where we actually need um, to work more with the private sector, uh, between the private sector and the public sector to together push each other, but also um, work together to scale together. Thank you, Tunichi. Would you agree <laughs> about the role of business? Are we placing too high hopes since the emissions are rising, or are you are you more on the line with Emma's view that? The initiatives are on their way just so they get the right incentives. 
if I paraphrased you correctly, Emma. Yes, well, I echo the uh, uh, the general intention of trying to create the proper circumstances for business to scale up, right? And I think that uh, you know, even one can even argue that with this COP, you know, that uh, it's been a twenty year uh, a twenty year process to get to it because of political pressure and really trying to create. Uh, the right circumstances for a public and private partnership, right? Because in truth, you know, there is huge resistance from, or at least with regards to concepts and intentions, you know, there is huge resistance by developed countries and businesses as well. But, you know, really that crumbles slowly because of the weight of uh, moral imperative, which translates into political pressure. So we can't really take those two apart. So I would I would be in agreement there, right? But in, but to echo uh, something else really is the uh, role of mitigation with regards to mitigation and emissions with regards to uh, creating these circumstances that are ripe for climate action, really, in both in the public and the private sector. And, you know, we, for, for a lot of, uh, for a lot of people working in, in this sector and really in the, in the front lines of COP, it's really the main uh, main work stream for them, truly. And with, with regards to trying to create that and putting it properly on the agenda text, it's really it's it becomes very difficult when you try to consider all the all the geopolitical you know conventions and modalities that people have to you know really work. Uh, and you're not really sure whether or not you want to work towards it, if you want to work against it. So it's a lot of these small intricacies that really build up what we can really describe as uh, something that isn't as, for lack of a better term, cohesion you know, with proper uh, with the proper work streams in place. Especially, so I know I don't think we're being uh, too optimistic with regards to, you know. Uh, placing our hopes on business and to deliver carbon neutrality. I think that it's always been a public and private partnership, but in the next, I'd say in the next 10 years as well, you know, we have to start thinking about whether or not uh, the ways that we approach, approach these um, different intricacies should change or not really. And but it's really, but honestly, in asking that question, that again, we engage the public private partnership and, you know, uh, try and get our answers. So, really, we're uh, chasing our. Um, I'm sorry, I think we. we get everybody to experience a bit of the bad internet connection again from Sharma Sheikh. So, sorry, I think we lost you, Tunichi. Okay, so uh, while we wait for Tunichi to come back, we'll, um, I'll, um, uh, I'll continue with the loss and damage. So uh, I was going to ask you, Malaika, if it was a success or not. Uh, of course, that's in, in, in the general discourse, that's how it's presented now, but I also seen some dissident voices. Uh, but if you were clearly on, on, on those who think that this was one of the most important outcomes. So, but still there is so much details missing, right? So what will we need to see happen at uh, the next COPs, 28 and 29, for us to, in two years time, say, oh, yeah, it was a success. Yeah, I think, uh, as you said, it has been attributed as a, as a success um, for this COP. And, but I would hesitate to fully call it a success until we see what comes next. Um, there's a lot of talk during this COP about it being an implementation COP. And I think the key question for a lot of small island developing states is exactly that. Will, what will it, will it be operationalized or will it be consigned to the same museum as past uh, plums, promises and pledges? Um, and so I think uh, I, would, I would hold off on sort of saying it's been a success. Um, purely in that sense. And I think we also need to consider the outcome of other funding pledges and, and, and promises 
um, because those are equally pressing. But then when we focus only or overly on loss and damage, then we risk diverting attention um, from those other um, equally pressing fronts. And then COP, the failure or success of COP becomes gets narrowed down to just one focus. So just to sum up, I think it would be we need to keep a close eye and keep pressure up and keep attention up to see what comes out um, next before we can really say it's been a success. But what do you think to, would need to be in place? What what do we have to? How will the mechanism look like for it to, for us to assess? Or the instrument? I think. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that uh, for for small island developing states or for for developing countries. Um, they need to see something concrete um, more than just to have this this um, this existing fund. Um, what what comes out of that? How does it? Um, where does the funding come from? And then who gets the funding? And how is the funding um, uh, utilized? Um, I think those are some of the, the the sort of important issues that we can't get away from um, when we're talking about this fund. And uh, TS, uh, from the uh, negotiator's point of view, what what would the, and, and the, from the EU point of view, since the EU was very very active in suggesting how the loss and damage uh, should find, be set up to be accepted, but also effective. Well, I mean, as I mean, we have now quite some work ahead of us to to um, during 2023 to make sure that this is set up in in the best possible way. I mean, again, we don't still don't think that this is the ideal solution, um, but I mean, it is also part of this mosaic of solutions which uh, has been had been discussed also in the run up to COP27. And I think it's fair to say, I mean, this has been quite high on the agenda since, I mean, a number of years. But I mean, I think it started coming up already uh, when we when we launched the Santiago Network, for example, in in at COP25. Um, so what we've been calling for also is for, from the Swedish perspective is to sort of to have this kind of overview of what is already available, and that that was the intention of the Glasgow Dialogue to sort of to have that kind of overview in place because we still believe that there are so many various channels which are being made available, and that is something which will be I will be bringing into the conversation now as to uh, how to make sure that we have something which is being fit for purpose. And I think sort of it's it sits also, you know, not sort of going too much ahead into the details, but I think now that we're here, we might also bring in to uh, bring in reflection on the climate finance landscape more generally. Uh, I mean, one of the reasons, one of the main reasons for us not being um, a proponent of the fund to start with was the fact that we have so many climate funds already. Um, and that there is there are access issues being raised and frustration among, among sort of accessing the finance in those funds. Should we maybe have a look at those more generally to see sort of is it really is it fit for purpose to have what is it five or six various types of climate funds? Um, I mean the GCF being sort of the the one sort of the biggest of the climate funds, but also that that having having said that, I mean the major, the majority of, of climate finance throw, flows through bilateral funds or bilateral uh, agencies, CEDA in the Swedish case, or through the multilateral development banks, the, the World Bank, uh, African Bank, the Asian Bank and so forth. That is where it's sort of the, I would I would say almost 80 or 90 percent of climate finance goes through bilaterals or the MDBs. So you know, how do we ensure that we have on the one hand sufficient finance also to meet the needs and when it comes to loss and damage, but also how those those institutions today are geared towards meeting the needs which developing countries themselves put forward to us as donors in the dialogue that we have with with you know that in that kind of donor dialogue that we have, and that is a dialogue which is not held within the UNFCCC context, but rather in our case then you know a dialogue which CEDA has with. Uh, partner countries, you know, with their finance ministries or planning ministries or ministries of finance and economy and so forth. That is where those kind of priorities need to be need to be put forward in order for us to be able to respond as efficiently as possible. You know, be it in a mitigation, adaptation, or what we within the UNFCCC context call loss and damage. So I think hopefully that could be part of this conversation as well as we move forward in establishing the fund during the course of next year. But uh, loss and damage is not only about, about the finance then uh, or these funding sources. Uh, the 
the Barbados Prime Minister Maria Martelly has spearheaded the, the Bridgetown agenda, which makes a specific point. Raising funding is not enough for loss and damage. Debt relief is also essential. What's the EU take on that? Uh, I don't think with that we have a, a joint EU position on the Bridgetown agenda per se, but I mean, I think it's definitely part of the conversation that you know, the, the various elements put forward in the Bridgetown agenda is something which we will need to be responding to through those channels. For example, in the in the Paris Club for when it comes to debt, uh, in, in within the, the boards of the MDBs when it comes to MDB reform. And I think it's also worth highlighting that the UNFCCC in as far as I know, for the first time called now for the reform of MDB's practices and policies, practices and priorities. I'm reading now from the decision text here um, where uh, and, and I think that's an important signal from from sort of from the climate community to the wider community that we are aiming for this sort of transformation of the economy in order to be able to uh, keep um, uh, to keep the goals and of the Paris Agreement, both when it comes to 1.5 and as well when it comes to resilience. Um, and I think that also speaks maybe to this, this wider point, which Emma made also on the, you know, what is needed for countries to accelerate their action? Well, there is, what is the investment climate in each and every country? What are the kind of institutions that we have in place in order to sort of to set the right kind of climate policies? How do we integrate climate action into our national budget and planning processes, for example, in order to be able to deliver the kind of climate policies that we need and also to attract the kind of finance needed for uh, for accelerating action? So I think that's that's a conversation which is, I would think, would be useful to have as well as in terms of what do all countries need to have in place in order for them to accelerate action according to sort of their own needs and priorities um, they've set out both in terms of their NDCs but also sort of look into sort of a wider development agenda as well. Thanks. To, to Nietzsche, uh, I know loss and damage has been an important topic for, for the Angus for, for quite some time. Yeah. So what, would you uh, agree about with the with the with the funding uh, uh, suggestions here, but also the, the importance of debt relief and how can it be, then be realistically achieved? It was, as Matthias pointed out, addressed at least the reform of, uh, of the, the, the the banks, but um, that provide the development uh, funding, but um, still that's a long way to go. How can this a debt relief that we have discussed in, well, we've seen it from time to time, of course, but uh, but it's been discussed for decades. Can it really be realistically achieved now? Well, with the, with the question of whether or not it can be realistically achieved, I do believe it can, you know, with the right, uh, with the right safeguards in place. I mean, or, and you can actually see that very closely, you know, in COP27 that, uh, uh, it's been brought to the to everyone's attention that the G77 and the vulnerable and other vulnerable vulnerable countries we don't have the same uh, priorities when it when it comes to loss and damage funding. So this uh, this modality of it being debt relief of it being uh, you know, debt relief and whether or not it could be trigger based financing it was a very great way for uh, in truth it was a very great way for and putting a price floor really on it is a is a very great way for the developed countries to really try and sow that division between the developing countries. But yes, it should be accessible, and requirements to access the fund should be should be as least onerous as possible, really, because for loss and damage, it means you know reducing the bureaucracy that comes with drafting the concept notes and applying for grants as well as lessening the number of signatories who have to sign off prior to the release of the amount needed. You know, and for a lot of developing countries, as well as their negotiators, really, we see it, we see that their positions are very experience based, right? Because when climate induced disasters happen, we can't go to these communities and talk about mitigation and adaptation. So how can we do that when we're experiencing the, when we're experiencing events that need funding immediately, right? We don't have time to think about resilient and long-term solutions. Of course, we have time for it, but we don't have the immediate time for it. And it's not just the time and energy, you know, the time and energy is quite a lot. So adaptation is not 
particularly the answer to what everyone's already been experiencing. Loss and damage itself is a global obligation for restitution, right? And I think that the MDBs, like the World Bank, would really, you know, in our conversations with them, really would prefer actually that uh, that line, really, because uh, these people and communities need to be restored and to be at a better place in the future, yes, but we need to design it properly because that's that should be the main difference of it between the other funds, right? That it should benefit the poor. It should benefit the benefit the poor, really, because many of our financial mechanisms of the UNFCCC are designed like that, but rarely do they benefit uh, the basic sector. So, for a lot of vulnerable countries, really, loss and damage is an element of social protection, right? It's not particularly. It can't be, for us. It can't be disaster finance. It can't. I mean, of course, it should be, but it should be. It should be adding layers to it. So at least that's what we're thinking of when we're in regards to kind of how we're building this fund forward. Thanks, uh, Malika. Uh, you just returned from Fiji, as, uh, as I mentioned, and even had the chance to not only talk to villagers but also to discuss lots of damage with the prime minister. Uh, so. Uh, so what is your perspective from that trip on the on the funding and the debt relief and the whole support mechanisms for loss and damage? Yeah, I think that I, I, I want to agree with what uh, Tanishi was saying in terms of um, where the finance, uh, when it's released and who it's released to and the difficulties in um, accessing that support. Because one of the things that stood out very clearly from um, being at that workshop in Fiji was the opportunity to uh, listen to um, people who were representing communities that were actually on the front lines. And that's a, a, a term that we use, it's sometimes overused. Um, but these are people who had experienced uh, the loss of, of their homes, loss of their communities. Some of them had to, to up, be uprooted and relocate. Um, and, and one of the things that they were talking about was the distance between them and not only the decision makers, but the financing. Um, so they don't see that financing forthcoming in a way that that is, is tangible to them, yeah. Um, and they also see a, a distance in the terms of that a lot of decisions are made in, in, in conference rooms or, or in, in, in boardrooms or, or fancy workshops, as they said. Um, but they, they argued that more of the discussion uh, should take place within their communities so that um, policymakers, decision makers could actually see it's not an abstract thing when you're talking about loss and damage in these communities. Um, so I think that that's not something that we should shy away from doing as well, um, because sometimes it comes across as being very paternalistic to communities, whether it be at the community level or whether it be at the country level. Um, the sense of that these countries should just be um, sit back and accept whatever it is that's uh, distributed to them or promised to them. Thanks. Uh, Richard, uh, this was an African COP and an adaptation, at least that was the expectation at the Glasgow that adaptation should be high on the agenda and um, progress should be made on the global 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 goal on, on adaptation. Was, was adaptation overshadowed by loss and damage? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, I mean, there, there is, uh, I think loss and damage, of course, comes out of a failure to be effective and ambitious enough on adaptation. Uh, the global goal of adaptation, as in the Paris Agreement, is um, it's, it's, it's there because it's important to have a global goal adaptation as well as one on, on mitigation, but it is much less precise than the one on mitigation or the temperature goal, so to speak. And um, as, as a result in trying to make it operational, like what does it actually mean? How do you know if you achieve progress towards the, the, the global goal? Um, you know, several years of, of, of sort of methodological and empirical and conceptual, but also political challenges made it impossible to really make much progress. And that's when in Glasgow, they uh, agreed on um, a two year work program on the global goal and adaptation, which in a way was a, a form of kicking the can. Hopefully by having eight workshops in total, parties would create uh, a better understanding of, of 
what um, the global goal could be. Um, now we're halfway. We've had four of these workshops, four more are planned, and part of the conversation in Schavenshack was about you know, the topics and themes for, for these next four workshops. But but something other something else happened which was interesting. There was a suggestion to uh, uh, take a structured approach towards developing a framework on a global goal and adaptation, and and that actually made it into the decision that was adopted. And and it's um, it, it's it's very weird because that framework is not specified particularly well. Uh, in particular, it doesn't actually say what the purpose of the framework is. So whether that is a relatively small framework to sort of guide the choice of indicators, that could be one thing, or whether it's like a really big framework that organizes how adaptation is negotiated, like the Cancun adaptation framework, um, it, it, that's completely open. But it is clear from the decision that this is something that should exist beyond the work program, because it says it would be reviewed before the second global stock take in 2028. Uh, so this is a bit of a question mark as to what that framework would be and, and whether that is just another way of kicking the can forward, which is worrisome because a concrete understanding of the global goal and adaptation is going to be important uh, by, you know, by the latest next year when the global stock take needs to um, be able to assess collective progress towards achieving the global goal and adaptation. Um, that's... Um, uh, I, I think I think adaptation is a, a bit of a uh, is, is becoming a bit of a problem under the negotiations uh, because on the one hand it is so incredibly important and necessary. On the other hand, it also appears very difficult to become concrete as to what adaptation ambition that actually means. Uh, we know we're not doing enough. The UNEP adaptation gap report specifies that the IPCC report has said it. But what then do we need to do better? What do we need to do more of? Is it just a matter of more finance? And if so, what will we be using the money for? Or is there something else more system, more systemic that needs to that needs to change? And and something else that happened, which I thought was was sad, um, in in Sharm el Sheikh, um, the IPCC talked about impacts of climate change becoming increasingly complex. It referred to compound and and, and cascading and cross-border climate risks, which at some point were mentioned um, both in the cover decision and in or in a draft cover decision and in the draft decision on the global goal adaptation. Uh, but in the end, uh, it, it disappeared. Um, maybe there were parties that felt uncomfortable about it. Maybe there were parties that felt that if we are going to open up the adaptation space, that that might lead to um, more demands for funding. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what happened, uh, but but the fact is that we are cop after cop failing to become more concrete on what adaptation action is actually needed and what it means to ramp up adaptation ambition. Great, uh, yeah, thanks. So uh, if we, uh, yeah, are we kicking the, the adaptation can forward, Matthias? And uh, can I ask the, the question, what, what would be required to uh, as uh, Richard what was uh, was uh, mentioning that what would be required for, for this uh, the global global adaptation or the whole adaptation framework to be uh, operational meaningful and and uh, legitimate and ultimately effective I think the I mean what was raised in the adaptation rooms is a, a question which has, I think has been raised many times before, and that is in essence, you know, how do we define success when it comes to adaptation in the same way as we can do for for mitigation? Um, in for mitigation, we have the 1.5 degree target or limit, um, and with and adaptation is not in the Paris Agreement. It's defined in the same sort of focused way, and and that at least is my sense of what we are trying to achieve. Uh, when we launched the work program on on the global goal and adaptation last year in Glasgow, um, and then as Richard you know highlighted, there was the suggestion of the framework which was put forward by by the by the G77 and the African group uh, on the very first day of negotiations, um, and I mean as as highlighted, it was it eventually made it into the the final decision text. And, and and of course now it's up to parties to elaborate on that during the course of 2023 to see what 
actually what comes out of that at, um, at COP28, but I mean, there was a decision to aim for a uh, deciding on the framework for the global goal on adaptation at COP28. So now it will be elaborated during the course of 2023. But I think it's worth highlighting, maybe this is more sort of a Swedish and a, maybe even a personal reflection from my side. You know, there's a, we, we, we and, and I think this also, so also speaks to your point, Gunola, on sort of the reform and the future of the UNFCCC process as such, because there is a tendency for us to sort of, when we have, when we're faced with a challenge or, or you know, an issue that we want to deal with, um, there's often calls for new types of reports and we, you, we need new data, you know, we need to get a work program going, we need to sort of, we need, we need workshops. When most often, I mean, the data, limited as it may be, but the data we have is already there. You know, it's, it's, uh, and we have, have, we have had various types of reports already sort of basically mm -hmm. outlining what the problems are and what we need to do. So it's not that we sort of need to do workshops on what we need to do. We rather need to do it in the countries themselves. Um, and just as a case in point, I mean, and of course we we all have different starting points. But Sweden presented its first its first adaptation communication now at, uh, at COP27, based on the kind of work that we're doing. Um, and uh, I mean, there is a call for countries to come forward with their adaptation communications. There are various types of guidelines both in terms of the NAPs uh, and, and of course for the NDCs and for the adaptation communications, what are the kind of data, which is the kind of data which needs to be included in these various types of reports. So in a way, I mean, you could, you could start using those maybe in a more coherent fashion across the various agenda items and across the various constituted bodies as they're called, which are already working on this. Um, I mean, we have the, we have the adaptation com committee, for example, we also have other committees working on adaptation, the, the least developed countries expert group, for example, um, where there is work ongoing. So how can we make sure that we're actually using sort of synergies or creating synergies between these various work strands already before we start embarking on new processes, which also we should recall are you know, creating capacity constraints in, in all countries, not only sort of in developing countries, but also for us. Um, so, sort of, we're creating more work for ourselves. Maybe not, but before we've sort of looked into what are the results that we've already achieved. Um, so, sort of just sort of as a not related specifically to adaptation, but more generally for the process itself, in terms of how we're using uh, um, our, our limited resources to make the best results we can within the process. Uh, thanks. Yeah. It's really interesting that I expect that we can return to the reform of, of and ideas of how to 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 um, to uh, organize the, the cops in the future. Maybe that's a, 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 the topic for a new for for a, for a new seminar like this. That would be super interesting. Uh, Emma, I, I would like to come back to the role of business. I mean, we, we address the leadership of our business and the important role in mitigation actions and so on. And, and as many of you know, the, the, a lot of these initiatives are listed at the, in the Global Climate Action Portal, which I think lists almost 14,000 companies and more than 1,500 investors globally in, in actions almost in a, all over the world. But, but if we just look at the, uh, what, the, what they do on adaptation, it's only 7% of the companies and 11% of the investors that have uh, that target adaptation in any of their actions. So, so is, is that, I think you, you, you mentioned, I think you gave us a, a bit of an answer in, in your introduction, is, uh, but I, I ask it now again anyway. <laughs> is adaptation the blind spot of business? I mean, yeah, I think I would like to definitely agree with Matthias just said, but also uh, loop back to what Richard mentioned earlier regarding actually the lack of understanding what actually adaptation means and what are the needs, what are the risks, what are the goals, and how can we then bridge those challenges into the solutions. And I think when it comes to mitigation, the companies and the private sector, they kind of understand that and they have set their net zero targets. They understand um, the 1.5 degree target and they have set their own um, I mean, strategies to try to contribute to that goal. But then when, I mean, also, especially after this COP, I think adaptation definitely will be even more of an important topic. But there, that's a, a challenge ahead of us to, to try to really make it more understandable what, what are the challenges are, what are the risks and um, 
um, and how can we then match those risks with the innovations that already exist or need to be innovated so that we can speed up the, the adaptation agenda as well. And what Mrs. Sweden is currently doing or been doing is focusing a lot, a lot of um, on the mitigation agenda where we've been trying to act as some kind of um, matchmaker or we sometimes jokingly say that we are a climate tinder where we try to match make the largest CO2 emitting markets and the largest CO2 emitting uh, sectors and also then look into those different countries to see what are the action plans, what are the NDCs, what are the concrete actions and that needs to be done in order for them to reduce the emissions within those sectors and then what we're trying to do is then to match make that with the Swedish innovations that we have in place but also maybe policy frameworks and green finance and similar to, to support with the, the mitigation agenda in those countries to speed up the global uh, transition. However, this is something we really need to do on uh, the adaptation agenda as well, so that we can also act as an adaptation tinder, so to say. Um, but then we also need to, we need more um, tangible in, yeah, actions and we need a clearer tool yeah, clearer tools and also I think a lot of support from not least scientists, but also work closer together with uh, different um, yeah, public sector um, stakeholders so, so that we can together try to, to crack this dilemma, so to say, because really the cost of an action is higher than the cost of action. And for every um, dollar invested in climate in adaptation and resilience, we save um, six dollars. And, and that also says a lot that I mean, obviously we know it's urgent, but it's also is a matter of survival once again, not only for um, yeah, the countries, but also for the, com the companies. Richard, adaptation Tinder. Is that, <laughs> the, is, that the, is that the recipe for uh, business contributing to the collective adaptation efforts? So. I'll, I'll, I'll sign like up right sounds away. Sounds like something for you. <laughs> yes, no, that's, that's, that sounds like a great idea. I, I think, Part of, you know, in Sharm el Sheikh, I was part of, a, of an event uh, held at, at the Swedish Pavilion by Business Sweden and, and co-hosted by the Global Challenges Foundation, which dealt very much with this uh, this question and there were representatives of several Swedish companies there. Um, I, I think that, it, you know, traditionally adaptation was very much seen as something that is that is local in every case is unique and mitigation is global and i think we need to move away from that uh what i think is a false dichotomy um there, there are plenty of of uh, examples of why adaptation is also a global challenge as it says in the paris agreement um and that private sector has a role to play in governing that global challenge um in 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 the old days so to speak you know i think maybe still for many companies their interest in adaptation is to see you know how how does climate risk affect them and what do they need to do themselves and how could they benefit from dealing with uh, climate change or helping others to adapt so there is the uh, so the self-interest in terms of addressing the risks to which they are exposed and there's the self-interest in terms of the um, opportunities that exist in, in making money out of adaptation. Um, and, and I think those are obviously very important um, sort of motivations for companies to look into adaptation. But I think there is an additional one, which is that, that companies are uh, uh, one part of the of, of the governance structure that has a shared responsibility to um, uh, reduce climate risks around the world. And that includes also looking at what actions they are taking themselves that may actually uh, affect uh, positively or negatively um, the exposure to climate risk uh, of others. And let me just give you an example, uh, and this links to the discussion on what's called just resilience, a term that the EU has introduced in its uh, uh, in its adaptation strategy uh, that came out in February last year. Um, the idea of just resilience being that it's not just resilience that you need to build up, but it's also how you build it up, that that there could be winners and losers as a result of adaptation. Um, and, and, you know, for example, we look at um, supply chain of agricultural commodities, say coffee. Um, you know, we drink a lot of coffee in Europe and much of it's imported from Brazil. Um, much of that's produced by smallholder farmers who um, may well become victims of, of climate change or climate shocks uh, as a result of drought and heat stress and so on. 
Um, those smallholder farmers are, are basically at the mercy of the big companies at the end of the supply chain um, who, who buy their, um, their crops and, and who for whom it might be very easy if the quality or quantity of, of their supply um, diminishes to move somewhere else and, and get their coffee from. So that means that these smallholder farmers are at risk not only of climate change, but also of the decisions made by corporates at the end of the supply chain on which they have uh, no influence at all. So this is where, um, you know, one example of where, where companies um, have a role to play to ensure that their adaptation decisions don't actually impose additional risk on others at the uh, at, at the beginning of the supply chain. Thank you. Thanks. Well, yeah, time is running up. I, I have two questions that I, I would like to ask you before we let the audience in. And uh, so maybe the answers can be a bit shorter, but maybe it's not possible to ask. Uh, the next one shortly, Matthias. Uh, Article 6 uh, and the we got some further clarity in, in the Paris rulebook, in particular uh, uh, Article 6, or some argue that it was more muddled and, and became much more unclear what, what the actual, what can be included or not and under, under what terms. Has the decision on Article 6 uh, taken the COP27 moved us closer to the temperature goals of uh, the uh, Paris Agreement? I, I'd actually be a bit hesitant in in making an assessment in terms of how much closer we were brought to limiting temperature rise with the decisions on Article 6. But I think it's fair to say, though, that uh, there's still work remaining to be done. Um, we had from the Swedish and the EU side wanted to sort of ensure um, transparency in reporting, for example, when it comes to Article 6. Um, and we're not quite there. Um, I mean, we have already started from the Swedish side through the Swedish Energy Agency in elaborating bilateral agreements uh, with a couple of countries uh, in applying Article 6. But uh, so that can sort of that can progress. But we would have benefited from having even more clarity coming out from COP27, which we still don't have. So there is still work to be done in ensuring sort of the reporting systems and the transparency of those. Uh, before we can say that you know we have as much as possible in place, and, and that goes for sort of both bo both strands of Article Six, both Six Two and and Six Four. So the sort of the bilateral parts and also the the multilateral parts of Article Six. So still work to be done. Richard. Yeah, thanks. I, I think whether or not we're getting any closer to the temperature goals of the Paris Agreement is in part perhaps determined by Article 6, but in general, of course, that's what much of COP27 was was about. Let me just reflect a bit more on whether or not COP27 sort of succeeded or failed in, in that sense. You know, there's a lot in the media about COP27 failed because, you know, 1.5 is now out of reach or, or, or maybe not, depending on, on how you how you see it. I, I think you know the whether or not a COP is a failure of success is not just determined during those two weeks. It's determined in the in the whole year leading up to it. And if we go back to Glasgow, where the UK government, um, you know, called on um, you know more ambition and, and lots of pledges were made, um, there was an agreement uh, to um, uh, update or enhance NDCs, for example. Uh, I think, you know, only, you know, not even 30 countries have actually updated or enhanced their NDCs this year, UK being one of them. Um, there was also a pledge to enhance uh, or strengthen um, finance uh, during 2022. Um, that, that hasn't really happened either. Um, so whatever happens during a COP is to a large extent also a reflection of what progress has been made uh, during the year. Um, and um, perhaps for very good reasons in 2022 with the geopolitical crises, uh, with the economic crises and, 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 and other um, important priorities uh, for, for global policymakers, um, the world has simply not made much progress and, and this, this could be seen. I think COP27 as a whole delivered pretty much as could be expected. Um, I think we would all have liked to see more ambition um, on uh, on the key issues of adaptation, mitigation and, and finance. Um, 
but we shouldn't just leave it to the to those two weeks at the end of the year uh, to um, uh, to ensure that ambition actually exists. Uh, I think um, all countries, including Sweden, uh, need to start doing their homework for COP28 already now. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, Tunisia, we, we discussed a lot on, on the role of business and, and the, the carbon markets under Article 6 and so on, but Greta Thunberg did not go to, to COP. She argues that we need a change of economic system, so and that's hardly going to, to happen at COP, which she also, she also said. So would you agree with her? Is that the change of economic system we need? And as, if that's not going to happen at COP, are you at the wrong venue? Hmm. Well, you know, um, with regards to that and uh, Ms. Uh, Thunberg's decision to not go to COP, you know, uh, our colleagues at Fridays for Future as well also have to weigh in and whether or not her presence would be, you know, disrupting the COP as well. So, you know, before we actually go into that answer, it's pretty, I think it's pretty important to know and for everyone to know that you know, young people nowadays, you have the most informed uh, generation of young people in the world, I think, or in the history of the world, rather. And and not just that, because you can see now that even activists in the bilateral sector very much consider the geopolitical spectrum with regards to uh, the gatherings of the UNFCCC. Right? So it's not particular, particularly that, um, you know, when we're focusing on uh, the need to change the economic system that comes obviously from an emotional standpoint that does come from the heart with regards to our, our frustrate with the young people and the youth and our and our frustration with the current system yes and whether or not it's hardly going to happen that cop is a very it's a very two-pronged question really and <laughs> and that's something that you know that uh, on its own has to kind of take fruit really and you know and that leads us actually to the other question of whether or not young people and activists are brought to cop only for mobilizations and activations you know are the our views being really uh, considered with regards to uh the decision text and really the agenda at the end of the day delayed action is uh probably the root of all this frustration and and you could really see that in COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh that you have about uh, you have a lot of monitoring and activity, correct? So in that in that end, really, it leads. If then again, it's just, it just keeps taking fruit. It leads to another question of whether or not um, the bilateral sector is given proper. Uh, for time and proper work streams at COP really to to be to be given. Great, thank you. I have so much more I wanted to ask, but uh, now it's uh, if we don't turn to the Q and A session, our times will be completely out. Uh, uh, well, gone. So uh, that now I leave over to Maria Cole to to ask you some of the questions from the audience. Or do you want me to post them? Uh, we have questions posted mm. in the Q&A chat, uh, so you can see some of them if they're um, particularly that you want to pick up. Uh, for example, we have here uh, questions to um, to Matthias and to um, Richard, I would say, uh, from Maria Janas, for example. In Glasgow, the agreement to increase the frequency of updates of the NDCs was highlighted as one of the main achievements. These updates have not been delivered as expected, and in light of early concerns uh, already before Paris of the fragility of NDCs as a building block for an international agreement, what are your reflections on the potential of the NDCs as a tool for driving climate action? I would say Matthias or, or Richard. 
I, I could go first then. Um, I think I mean, we, we need to see the NDCs as sort of at the core of the Paris Agreement. Um, and I mean, we, I think it was encouraging to see ahead of COP26 the number of NDCs that were updated uh, in line with sort of the first NDC cycles um, and that they were expected to be updated. But still, of course, we it's clear the level of ambition to which countries can have and these are still nowhere near where, where it needs to be. And so and hence the call from COP26 to update and we revisit and strengthen as text was, which is then also retained and repeated now in the in the COP27 text um, that those countries have not yet done so to do so. Um, so I think that will be part of our work uh, through the EU during the course of 2023 and going forward also that we want to see uh, uh, repeated updates of the NDCs uh, in, in order to ensure to deliver as, as high ambition as possible. And that was also sort of the, what we had hoped for in the mitigation work program, which has now established that creating that kind of space, which would facilitate the updating of the NDCs in line with the latest science. And also again, with the opportunities and kind of solutions that business, for example, could offer uh, to, uh, to accelerate both design and implementation of the NDCs. Yeah, I, I have very little to, to add to that. I, I, you know, as I said in my previous answer, I think the fact that only well, less than two dozen uh, new NDCs were available before the COP started uh, was one of the factors uh, that led to the relatively limited success of COP27. Um, and, um, you know, as, as I said, I think countries need to uh, make sure they uh, don't just show up at, at COP28, but that they show up prepared and, and knowing what um, what ambition they can offer. Yes, uh, we also have a question from George, for example, uh, saying that we might remember COP27 as the COP that brought the 1.5 limit out of reach. Uh, the parties did not agree uh, a way to nearly half emissions until 20, uh, to half the emissions until 2030. Uh, three years without strong mitigations are already gone in this decade and time may have run out. What is your comment on this? Um, Malaika, for example. Um, yes, I actually, you know, when I had the opportunity to speak with uh, some Pacific representatives as well as the, uh, the Prime Minister of Fiji, one of the things that they said was that uh, they're not optimistic about 1.5. Um, they think 1.5 is, is, is dead, to use their words. Um, and if, as someone else pointed out, if the sort of developed countries aren't willing to make the changes that need to be made, made, but then we just continue sort of having these discussions and these talking talking shops, um, then we don't we don't have a realistic hope of of, of reaching that 1.5, and we can continue speaking and speaking about it, uh, but then nothing changes. So it's hard to maintain some level of optimism when there isn't enough evidence that enough is being done. Yeah. What about you, Emma? Do you have any comments on this 1.5 goal? I mean, I, I think once again, coming back to the urgency, but also the importance of that we're talking the same language and that we are aligning the negotiation agenda with the solutions. The sooner we actually understand what but the challenges and the risks are and the needs are and actually the existing solutions that we have in place today. We do have innovations bold enough to make a real difference and we do also have yeah, companies ready to do their part. So yeah, the sooner we can meet and talk to each other to ensure that we actually can align the, these agendas, the sooner we can actually reach the targets and, and reach the, I mean, yeah, turn the, the goals into actions. I think that is my my comment comment on this. Could I come in there, Maria? Yes, of course. Uh, just I think it's you know we we need to keep in mind as well. I mean, I, I mean this is stating the obvious maybe, but eighty percent of global emissions are from the G twenty countries. So in order for us to be able to limit temperature rise to one point five, the G twenty need to do their part. The largest emitter is China. Uh, we all know that. 
Um, and I mean, we we need as the G20 countries to ensure that we are doing what we can to to limit temperature rise within our respective jurisdictions. Within the EU, as you know, when we've set our target to be um, at least reducing by 55 percent by 2030. We're probably seeing that to be increased during the course of next year. Maybe you know, Franz Timmermans mentioned that we're already at, at uh, minus 57. Um, and we've seen those kind of signs also from the US, but of course we need to see those from all G20 countries to make sure that we, I mean, there was a suggestion even for the cover decision to mention peaking by 2025 on a collective scale. Uh, so those, I mean, it is the G20 which need to deliver mitigation ambition for us to be able to limit temperature rise to 1.5. Yes, of course. Anyone else that wants to chime in on this one or? Otherwise, we have a question around also loss and damage and, and funding. There's been a lack of climate funding and much of the funding promise was not made available. How will this new fund for loss and damage be different, you think? I can um, I, I can try and respond at least in part of that. Um, yes, there are other funds. Um, many of which could fund activities that uh, at least help to um, uh, minimize the avert loss, uh, loss and damage. Um, the Adaptation Fund, uh, the Green Climate Fund, the Global Environment Facility uh, and, and other funds that are not necessarily under the convention but funded by, by donor countries. Um, the, the problem is in part that there isn't enough money. The problem is also that the procedures for countries to access the money are very, very cumbersome and um, that um, it is a priority for, in any case, the Adaptation Fund. I spoke at some length with the uh, people heading the Secretariat of the Adaptation Fund um, to, uh, to make it easier for countries to access funds and, and also to um, you know, work with their board to make sure that um, uh, some of the difficult decisions about whether or not funding actually goes to adaptation or whether this is seen as development and so on, that some of these decisions uh, are, are, are not deal breakers when it is obvious that uh, a project can have a positive adaptation benefit. Um, so I think it's it's yes, funding is important and there needs to be more of it. But at the same time, it needs to become easier um, for countries to, to access the money. Um, at the same time, of course, that also needs to come with uh, clear transparency and accountability on how that money is then being used. Yes, we have also someone here who, who says that they wonder if you see the timing and location of the COP27 as a negative feature that had impact on its result, uh, suggesting bad timing as the G20 at the same time in Egypt, uh, Egypt as a location. What, what, what do you say? And maybe you also can uh, chime in here, um, uh, Björn Ola, on the discussion of is this the right format? You're, you're muted. <laughs> Yeah, I let the panel start and then I can also chime in. So what do you say, Mattia, for example, on uh, um, timing and location? Timing, yes. I mean, we actually last year ahead of COP26, we had maybe sort of a the successive timing of events, including the G20 summit was maybe more favorable. Um, but I think we shouldn't maybe make too much of, a, of an issue of the timing. It's um, it, it is when it is, I mean, it's usually during this time of year, as is the G20 summit. Um, and as to the place, I mean, I think uh, it's it's that also that's part of the, the regular rot rotation scheme within the within the UNFCCC. Um, so uh, it was uh, it was Africa's turn and now next year it's it's Asia in, and then hence we will be in Dubai. So it's um, that's that's part of the, the structure of the process. Yeah. <clears throat> 
of course, it was not ideal to have it in, in, a, in a repressive country like, like Egypt, evidently, for, for, for the civil society engagement. Also, the lobby presence were, were I think, unusually high this year. Uh, might be an explanation where, where it was located. But still, I think this, it's brilliant that it goes around. And, and I, I know many have complained. Why is it in Poland so many times? Well, this is the only, only country in, in Eastern Europe who, who offers to, to host it. But at the same time, if it's been also hosted by the countries who, who don't want to be in the forefront, that that builds a lot of that, a really robust process because it, even if it survives there and moves forward, uh, when those countries are hosting it, it, it creates a legitimacy for the whole process. That said, I think it's a lot to be done to reform how the, the COPs are set up, but I like the, 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 the fact that they run each year and they have also other functions. We talk about this fair and, and sort of the, the, the display functions, uh, which we talked about in the role of our business. But when it comes to peace building and trust building in the world, I think that it's phenomenal. Uh, success from the UNFCCC, that all countries in the world agree on uh, that there is a problem and agree to deal with it. And also that we saw that this year that China and, and, and the US took up their dialogue, which they started in Glasgow, uh, and, and then cancelled when, when Nancy Pelosi, the speaker, former speaker of the no, she's still the speaker, the speaker of the house until uh, January, uh, visited Taiwan. The China took the drastic measures of cancelling that. And that was regarded as a drastic measure to cancel the climate talks with the US, uh, which tells us something about the, the prominence of the issue and the importance uh, of climate change, also to be bridge builded between the US and China. And now that dialogue is, is open again. So that function of the, the multilateral uh, negotiations, I think, can't be underestimated. And it's also part of the whole process, which you sometimes forget. Thanks for asking me as well. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Uh, yeah, maybe yeah. maybe we we are speaking of. Uh, thanks for giving me a chance. I, I, I should. Le uh, we have a teaser left from from the introduction, which uh, Tunichi never uh, got to uh, to give this inside tip. But, but before I do that, I would just like to to thank Maria Cole. I think I forgot to introduce you as well, right? Didn't I? Yeah. So you are the lead of communications in Mr. Geopolitics. Uh, and together with, with the fantastic communication team at Stockholm Environmental Institute, which you see the, the resource of today, that we can have this event together with CSBR. Uh, they're, they're, if you're interested in following the news and the, the newsletters, I think we will post in the, in the chat function where you can sign up for uh, for the for the newsletter and, and, and also the website where you can go in and see the, the news. Uh, yeah, and speaking about news then, what is your inside tip, Tunichi? All right, well, actually I'll keep it short because I'll just echo something that I and some of the other panelists have said before that really um, with regards to the loss and damage finance, uh, loss and damage fund, really it was born out of uh, cooperation really and this unity between the G77 and vulnerable countries but we really saw in COP27 that uh, even the different negotiating groups really at, our, at its core different parties have different intentions for with regards to what the LND what LND will bring them down the line we saw that with discussions and interventions by AOSIS and small island developing states as well as other Asian countries as well because you know really for us the the uniting force of it is really or what we're what really developing countries are fighting against is really the fear of liability and compensation right and it really is such an unfounded fear in this discussion you know it puts it puts the uh, it puts developed countries and cam and campaigners towards it in a very bad light because uh, historical responsibility and liability obviously is will always be a state of play, really. But something that uh, the media wasn't really uh, uh, particularly reporting on was really that divide between the vulnerable countries and really what our intentions are. Because in you can see in some interventions that uh, certain parties are yes, some certain parties are okay with it being insurance based because of course they'll they're they're going to get that insurance, right? And it really goes goes back to whether or not 
these climate impacts are are so are happening so often that yes, we can anticipate insurance, right? And whether or not we're okay with trigger based financing, you know. And we, I think, actually, the L and D fund really is a very politically good outcome. You know, it's good that while it's being created and designed, that we should already pilot things on the ground. Right? Uh, institutions such, such as the Stockholm Environment Institute, which uh, supports a lot of our projects on the ground as well, you know, uh, it's a good thing to pilot these things. Thank you. Thank you so much. And you get the final word because our time is up. I should just say thank you to the panelists. Fantastic contributions. It's so valuable that you took your time to share your, your expertise and your insights. That was, was, was great. And thanks to the audience with tons of, of other great questions. But um, uh, and thank you for, for contributing. And um, well, two is a trend and thrice is a tradition. So welcome back after COP28 for what would then be our traditional post-match analysis, hopefully with, in, a, in a brighter mood and the future ahead. So, thanks, you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.